turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. By the way, we have a baptism today, in case that wasn't obvious. So right after the service, we'll be doing uh, a baptism. Matthew chapter 5. Today's text concerns believers being salt and light. Being salt and light in our social surroundings. Unfortunately, being salt and light in your social surroundings these days can get you into a lot of trouble. Some in the salt and light brigade have paid penalties for operating as salt and light in their social surroundings. For example, a teacher in New Jersey was suspended for giving a student a Bible. A football coach in Washington was placed on leave after saying a prayer on the field at the end of the game. A fire chief in Atlanta was fired for self-publishing a book defending Christian moral teaching. And a Marine was court-martialed for pasting a Bible verse above her desk. Now, some in our culture argue that Christian schools don't deserve accreditation because they're simply indoctrination centers. Christian student groups like InterVarsity have been kicked off of many college campuses. Christian homeschooling has been called by some influencers to be tantamount to child abuse. Christian charities, including adoption agencies, hospitals, and crisis pregnancy centers, have become the objects of attack. You see, being salt and light in our culture translates into being some kind of a bigot or a hater. So how can we operate as salt and light in a culture like ours, a culture that is in the process of deconstructing, a culture that is determined, it seems, to destroy itself, because as it turns out, deconstructing actually means more than deconstruction, it means demolition. French philosopher Jacques Derrida coined the term deconstruction. He argued that in Western culture, people tend to think and express their thoughts in terms of binary oppositions, masculine, feminine, progressive, traditionalist, liberal, conservative. Derrida suggested these binary oppositions are actually hierarchies in miniature. They contain one term that Western culture views as positive or superior and another that the Western culture views as negative or inferior. The only way to change this, according to Derrida, is to overthrow all present cultural institutions, hence the need for deconstruction. However, what we are finding is that in deconstructing our culture, we are leaving it without any boundaries and thrusting it into chaos. Now, sociologists have different models for describing how culture change happens. One such model is called the classic culture change model. That model suggests that cultural change builds on three stages. The first stage is called unfreezing the unfreezing stage, and that is when the beliefs of a majority of people in the culture have to be unfrozen and made fluid again through a series of critical events. For any lasting change to occur, all current beliefs, ideas, customs, whatever they may be, have to be unfrozen, placed again into a fluid state, And in our culture, presently, we call this deconstructing. Now, once you have done this, once you have sufficiently deconstructed or unfroze currently held beliefs, the second stage is to introduce change through role modeling 
and the setting of new behaviors, new ideas, and new beliefs. Once present beliefs are unfrozen, the trick is to quickly introduce new ideas, new behaviors, and new beliefs before the culture has a chance to refreeze. And that is the last stage. The final stage is then to refreeze or lock in the new changed culture. Now, a good example of this would be how sexual customs of this country have changed over time. Old sexual customs were unfrozen and made fluid again. Then new sexual customs and ideas were introduced, and eventually the culture refroze and locked in to the new sexual customs. That's how this happens. And this is happening all over again, as you know, with reference to sex and gender issues. We are presently in the first two stages of sweeping cultural change. Right now, the culture is being unfrozen or deconstructed, and new ideas, new beliefs, and new customs are being introduced. Now, I don't think we've locked in yet, but we are awful close, and perhaps it is too late to turn back. So with this in mind, as our backdrop, let us consider our text today, Matthew 5, verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and give, it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Now, please note that Jesus tells us we are salt and light. And in the Greek, it is stated emphatically, you and only you are the salt of the earth. You and only you are the light of the world. The emphasis is on our identity rather than on our behavior, although it is true that our behavior is meant to reveal our identity. Today, salt and light are rather common and ordinary commodities in our world. But in the first century, when Jesus spoke these words, those two things were greatly treasured, salt and light. And Jesus warns that salt can lose its saltiness and light can be hidden. In other words, their intended purposes can be thwarted and rendered useless so as to prevent them from accomplishing their purpose. So let's take a closer look at each of these elements. You are the salt of the earth. Our English word salary comes from the Latin word salarium, which literally means salt money. Salt was so precious a commodity that Roman soldiers were often paid for their labor in salt rations. This is where we get the expression, that man is not worth his salt. Now, why was salt so valued? Salt was valued because it was the only means of preserving meat, keeping it from decaying in an ancient world without refrigeration. It was used for other things as well as a seasoning, but nonetheless, its primary value was in slowing decay. Now, critics of Jesus like to point out that salt actually does not lose saltiness. And this verse is often held out as an example of Jesus misstating a fact and proving himself fallible because salt does not lose its saltiness. Now, these critics are assuming that Jesus speaks of salt in what we would refer to as table salt. Salt, in a pure form, is very stable. It does not lose saltiness, ever. Nevertheless, in the ancient world, they did not typically get salt in a pure form. The type of salt with which Jesus' hearers would have been familiar 
was salt like that found around this, the Dead Sea. That's where they collected their salt. It was not pure salt, but it was salt mixed in with other minerals that nevertheless formed a white powder that they called salt. In other words, the white powder had salt in it, but the white powder itself wasn't salt. Unfortunately, the salt component in that white powder could be easily dissolved if the powder became wet. And sometimes they were left with only a white powder that they still called salt, while in point of fact, the salt in the powder had been washed away, leaving it without any true saltiness. So it wasn't really the salt losing its saltiness as much as it was the white powder losing its salt. And when that happened, the leftover minerals were not useful for stopping decay or seasoning, and so they would say, the salt has lost its saltiness. So the analogy is this. There is something about Christians living like Christians in community, according to Jesus, that slows societal decay. Somehow the presence of Christians in a community keeps that community from completely rotting away into depravity. This means that the only hope for our present culture being preserved from the degeneracy of a continual downward spiral in which it is presently heading is for Christians to live like Christians at home, at work, at school, and in each and every social situation in which they are placed. Why is our world changing? It is changing because every year in the United States there is more meat and less salt. The American church is not growing. Presently, despite the apparent success of our mega churches, we are barely keeping place, a pace rather, with simply replacing the number of Christians who die each year. Society at large is becoming more secular. And as it grows more secular, it gets more hostile to Christian values and Christian principles. Imagine how many people in the city of Bakersfield, percentage-wise, probably went to church in the 1950s compared to how many people presently in the church in Bakersfield go to church on any given Sunday. I assure you, the percentage is much, much lower now than it was in the 1950s. And what is true for Bakersfield is true for the rest of the country. Why? What, what happened? What happened was the saltiness of the church was lost over time as the church started churning out cultural Christians instead of biblical Christians. Right now, two-thirds of American young adults who attend church on a regular basis as a teenager say they dropped out of church between the ages of 18 and 22. Why? The two biggest reasons for them leaving the church and deconstructing their faith are the issues of social justice and sexuality. This is believed to have happened because many children were raised to be cultural Christians instead of biblical Christians. Cultural Christianity is only superficially identified with Christianity at all. Cultural Christians do not truly adhere to the faith doctrines of Christianity. Cultural Christians become very uncomfortable with traditional biblical values. They were the first ones to adopt views more palatable to the unbelieving world. This meant moving away from biblical positions on sexuality, gender, salvation, sin, hell, and other issues not embraced by popular culture. Cultural Christians want to move with the flow of their surrounding culture, not against it. Well, that flow is always away from God and away from biblical values. And yet the whole point of the Sermon on the Mount is to show how we are to be 
countercultural. We're to be different from society at large, but not different in the way we just typically view it, not externally only. We often try to show we are different by emphasizing the external things that we do or do not do. However, that just translates to the unbeliever that Christianity is about following rules. We tend to focus far too often on our external differences with the world, and that is why we so easily fall into the trap of trying to operate as salt and light only in the political sense. We attempt to conform the world to our standards by applying various kinds of pressure. We try to legislate salt and light rather than be salt and light. If we operated as salt and light, as we were truly meant to do it, in a spiritual sense, by allowing this new life in Christ to reveal itself in our attitudes and actions, that would have a much greater impact. People change inside out, not outside in. We cannot use worldly methods to cause spiritual changes, but we try. The Beatitudes are the key to our operating as salt and light. The kind of Christians who actually live the Beatitudes in the world have the greatest influence over the world. In other words, a holy life has the greatest influence and makes the biggest impact. We operate as salt whenever we are poor in spirit, when we accept apart from Christ left to our own devices that we are morally corrupt and spiritually destitute. We operate as salt when we mourn over the human condition apart from Christ, we're more sad than mad. We operate as salt when we hunger and thirst for righteousness. We operate as light when we're meek and humble. We operate as light when we are merciful, when we are peacemakers, and when we are willing to be persecuted for righteousness' sake. Expressing the fruit of the Spirit and the Beatitudes shows the world that we don't just act different, we are different. If we cease to be different, We cease to make a difference. If we conform to the world's attitudes and actions, how will the world see that Jesus has transformed us? If we act just like them, use the same methods that they do to accomplish their goals and objectives, how will they see that we are different? Unchanged lives do not change lives. Unless there is a distinction between us in the way that we live in the way that we think, in the way that we feel, in the way that we speak, in the way that we relate, in the way that we serve, and the way that we give, we cannot and do not operate as salt or light. This means we cannot wash away what makes us salty, which is exactly what happened to cultural Christians. We cannot deny the Bible. We cannot celebrate and honor sin. We cannot downplay the necessity of repentance from sin. And we cannot redefine biblical truths to accommodate culture. But here's the good news. It actually doesn't take that much salt to get the job done. Just a little bit of salt can make a big difference. The permeation of salt is incredible. Just a little bit of salt makes something salty. The ocean tastes salty no matter where you go in the world. Even though salt by weight only makes up 3% of the ocean. So a big part of what makes us salty is simply standing firm on biblical values and expressing those biblical values in a biblical way is how we operate as light. And that is the next thing Jesus says. You are the light of the world. 
A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men. They may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Salt works more indirectly and is hidden. Light is more open and direct. I've noticed whenever I walk into a dark room, I don't yell out, hey, somebody turn off the darkness. Instead, I ask for someone to turn on the light. It seems to me that a lot of times our strategies to operate a salt light of the world is that we're trying to turn off the darkness instead of being a light. The only way to vanquish darkness is to bring in light. And here light is being used as a metaphor for good deeds. However, Christians can only ever be light in a derivative sense, like the moon, which does not produce light by itself. It only can reflect light. So we aren't the source of light. The source of light is in us. This is how we can, as Paul says, live or walk as children of light in Ephesians 5. Those without light must make do in darkness, and darkness impairs their vision. They cannot see that their deeds are wrong because they have no light. Those in darkness do not understand the cause or effects of sin. Their whole thinking process is warped by the darkness they live in. Only the light of revelation will give them the light of recognition that their deeds are evil. Jesus says we are to operate as lights of revelation with the light coming from our good deeds so that others will, by that light of revelation, be given the light of recognition about the source of the light that we have. The purpose of light is to reveal. Witnessing is as much about something you are as it is about something you do. I find that people like to see a sermon before they're willing to listen to a sermon. Some folks don't like the sermon they see, so they won't listen to the sermon you say. I know in my own life, there have been many times when people were not interested in the sermon I would say because they did not like the sermon they saw. Jesus says our lives should shine in the darkness like a city on a mountain cannot be hidden. Many ancient cities were made of white limestone so that as the sun set, its rays caused the city walls to reflect that light. And it was noticeable for miles. It was especially helpful for travelers that found themselves on the road late at night. They could see illumination of some city up ahead of them in the distance, and they could navigate their way to that city even though it was growing dark. Jesus pointed out the ridiculousness of a lit lamp being placed under a basket so that no one could profit from its light. What is the point of lighting a lamp only to hide the light? Now, both the salt and light illustrations are meant to tell us that although we cannot change what we are, we are salt, we are light, we can waste what we are. We can lose our saltiness. We can hide our light. Notice what happens, Jesus, according to Jesus, when you shine your light before men. If you're shining your light in the right way, Jesus doesn't say, they will praise you. He says, they will praise your Father in heaven. So what we graciously do down here on earth directs others' attention to look up to heaven with gratitude. Now you will notice that according to these metaphors, there are two different ways that we are called upon to act in this world. One of the ways we are called upon to act is to hold firm to biblical values by which we delay in some way the decadence of our society Salt's work isn't always obvious, it's stealth, it's secret, goes slowly. The world has no idea how blessed it is with the presence of Christians. If the world is as corrupt as it is right now with Christians present in it, 
Imagine what civilization would be like without any Christians in it at all. The world likes to think that if the Christians on this earth suddenly disappeared, oh, what a paradise that would be. But the truth is it will become hell on earth. If I am correct in my eschatology, a day is coming when all Christians will be removed from the earth. And without the restraining influence of Christians, the world is going to plunge into darkness and evil such as never occurred at any time in human history. The other way we influence society is as light. Light, unlike salt, works openly, quickly, directly. The purpose of light is to reveal and illuminate. People only see the work of Jesus within us when we reveal his presence within us through what we do. This is why James, the half-brother of Jesus, says in chapter 2 of his epistle, he says, I will show you my faith, which you cannot see here on the inside of who I am, by my deeds, which will be on the outside. People can't see what you believe until you act on those beliefs. Which is why James keeps asking in chapter 2 of his, of his epistle, what good is it, he says. What good is our faith if we don't reveal it? If we as Christians hide our faith by our lack of deeds. He concludes, faith without deeds is useless just like Tasteless salt and hidden light. Why does Jesus put it in that order? Why doesn't he begin with you are the light of the world and then talk about us being the salt of the world? Why does he talk about us being the salt of the world first and then the light second? I think it's in that order because if we lose our saltiness, we hide our light. Losing our saltiness happens first. We always do that first. We start to not hold firmly to biblical values, begin to lose our saltiness, and then we hide our light. Cultural Christianity has led to the church losing its saltiness, and it has no light to shine. And society decays and plunges into darkness. Researchers with the National Study of Youth and Religion at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill took a close look at the religious beliefs held by American young people. They discovered most American young people held to what the researchers called moralistic therapeutic deism. Moralistic therapeutic deism. What's that? Well, they said... This belief system believes in a God who acts benevolently over humankind, but never judges, never chastens, never challenges. This God only wants people to be good and nice and fair to each other. The central goal of life is to be happy. And to feel good about oneself. The God in this system doesn't have to be particularly involved in one's life. Except when you need to resolve a problem, you may go to God and ask him to help you resolve your problem. But most of the time, you don't want him bothering you. And he is happy to oblige. He doesn't bother you. And they believe that all good people go to heaven when they die, no matter what it is they happen to believe. Moralistic therapeutic deism means the belief system is moralistic insofar that becoming a good person is the goal. But here's the catch. It's you have to become a good person as the culture defines good, not as the Bible defines good. The only true good is whatever the culture decides is good, not what the Bible says is good. And in fact, holding to traditional biblical values is not good in this system because the culture does not presently think those values are good. But it tries to be moralistic. But it's probably more interested in being therapeutic, which is the second part. 
there's this relief that God is really here to provide therapeutic benefits to me. This is not a religion of repentance from sin. God in this system is more like a divine butler and cosmic therapist. As the divine butler, he is always on call to take care of any problems that arise. But as, and as the cosmic therapist, God is mainly concerned with therapeutically helping people to feel better about themselves. And he doesn't get too personally involved in what else you're doing. He doesn't get judgy in the process. He only comforts. He never challenges. So the deity of this system is a loving, mostly hands-off God. This is what most American young people believe, according to this research. It just wants everybody to be nice and be happy. And this belief system ignores passages about sin and death repentance. When directives in the Bible don't line up with what the cultural Christian wants to do, the cultural Christian simply rationalizes that God didn't actually forbid that. Or does it mean what it appears to say? In 1939, Philip Van Doren Stern wrote a short story called The Greatest Gift which he was successful, or unsuccessful rather, he was unsuccessful in getting that story published. He tried earnestly for several years. In 1943, he finally decided to use his story as a Christmas card so it wouldn't go to waste. And he figured if he couldn't get anyone else to read it voluntarily, perhaps his family and friends would read it at Christmas out of guilt. Somehow, that Christmas card with that story came to the attention of a movie producer who showed it to the Hollywood agent for Cary Grant. And in April 1944, RKO Pictures bought the rights to that story for $10,000, and they wanted to turn it into a vehicle for Cary Grant. They wanted to make a movie about it with Cary Grant as the star. RKO then created three unsatisfactory scripts before they just shelved that movie. The script was later sold to someone else, and they did finally get to make it into a movie. But when that movie was shown at the box office, it underperformed. However, over time, it started to catch on. And it even came to be regarded as a classic American film. In fact, the American Film Institute listed it as one of the 100 best American films ever made. What is the film? It's a Wonderful Life, which is now a staple of Christmas television around the world and is considered one of the most loved films in the American cinema. The story, as you know, centers on George Bailey, who mistakenly believes his life has been meaningless. George is shown by his guardian angel, Clarence Oddbody, exactly what the world would have been like if he had never been born. Through that process, George learns that he's actually made a great, greater impact on the world than he ever even dared imagine, and that his life has really, in fact, been a wonderful life. You see, George Bailey hadn't realized the importance of his simply serving as both salt and light in the Bedford community. You ever wonder if the world would be different if you had never been born? My guess is that most certainly the world as we know it today would somehow be different if anyone in this room had never been born. But let me modify that question just ever so slightly. Would the world be different spiritually if you had never been born? That's an entirely different question, isn't it? What kind of difference have you made in the world spiritually? 
Jesus says, you and only you, you and only you are the salt in your neighborhood. You and only you are the light in your neighborhood. You and only you are the salt in your workplace. You and only you are the light at your school and to your family and friends. Paul says to the church at Corinth, bad company corrupts good morals. But the reverse of that is also true. Good company corrupts bad morals. Yet how will we ever make a difference if we seem to be no different from the rest of the world? If we try to effectuate change the same way that the world does, how will we convince them of their need to change their lives if our lives appear unchanged? How can we expect transformation in others if we do not expect it in ourselves? You and only you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You and only you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we consider your word, we have a great privilege and we have a great responsibility. Our great privilege is to be your ambassadors in this world, to preach a message of reconciliation, to operate assault and light in our communities. Lord, we want to be a people that not only make a difference in this world, but make a difference in the next world. We want to be a people that make a spiritual difference in the world. Reveal to us where in our lives right now you are providing us with opportunities to operate as salt and light. And may we, in dependence upon your spirit, seize those opportunities. And Lord, may you redeem those opportunities in bringing people to yourself. We thank you and praise you for all these things. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. And all God's people said,